who um, neither of which could be here today, but look forward to joining us. Diane B. Pinckney, Perky, I'm sorry, Perky. She's retired, alumni of AU, lived in, has lived in DC for over 20 years, and learned about AOI from Virginia, member Virginia Daly. And Mark Conheady, who um, is in real estate, a CPA, learned and also learned about AOI from Virginia Daly. I think you need to talk into that. Oh, okay. Oh. There you go. Because now I can hear myself. So, <laughs> so I'll repeat. Diane B. P Perky and Mark Conheady are our two newest members, and they were both introduced to AOI by Virginia Daly. And we also have a member who joined last time but wasn't able to make the, um, I introduced him at the last meeting, but this is the first meeting that he's been able to, luncheon, he's been able to make, Jeffrey Slavin. Welcome. Would you like to say anything? No, I'm only going to talk for a minute, but I, I am a native Washingtonian, born 1955, so I do qualify to the age requirement uh, at GW Hospital. And uh, I also um, worked many, many years ago at the, at the DC Council, so I have many, many connections. And I, and I hope to, I was just talking to my new recruit, Helen Moody, who is a seventh generation, something like that, Washingtonian. And, and I do hope to bring many, many uh, members to this uh, fantastic organization. I do want to thank Carolyn for recruiting me. It's on this. Well, and, and technically, because Helen just filled out the application and Jeffrey gifted her the membership, she's a new member. Yeah. So let's welcome her. <laughs> Would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, and a uh, model and Westmore, Governor, Maryland Governor Westmore, I just found this out today, godmother. Oh. <laughs> Is our, do we have, we have a lot of visit, uh, visitors. If you'd like to introduce yourself, just mm -hmm. please stand up and... I know Carl has some guests. Let me come that way. Carl, you introduce your guests? No, you introduce your guests. Judd, come on. Hello, everyone. Um, I have with me Judd French and his beautiful wife, Emily. Judd is uh, an ancient D.C. guy, and he has the distinction of coming and having been related to, I don't know if they still claim him, to the uh, sculptor of the Lincoln statue that's in Lincoln Memorial. So. Please speak into the mic for us. Oh, okay. Judd, you'd make it easy. You stand up. This is Judd French. And this is his wife, Emily. And they are, I call them prospective members because I think they filed their papers. And, but they have great DC connects. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Good to see you, Rob. Judge Roquander is here. <laughs> yes, Mary, stand up. Mary Barbuto, a very infrequent visitor over the years. Ever since we were down at the uh, Main Avenue, uh, she was born on Tewksbury Street, right behind Nativity Catholic Church on Georgia Avenue. So she's a native Washingtonian, as I am. I'm third generation. She's second, I guess. <laughs> So I'm actually really embarrassed because I've been here before, so. <laughs> but, but this is the first time at this venue, and this is a beautiful venue, so congratulations on the venue. Like this? Is that better? Okay. I'm Vicki Crawford, and I did not grow up in Washington, D.C., but on my father's side, I'm a fifth-generation Washingtonian, and I have brought one of my childhood friends, Jane Allen, who has recently returned to Washington, D.C. from living in Boulder, Colorado, for quite a number of years. Oh. 
Other guests? Don't, don't leave it to us to identify. Guests? <laughs> going once, going twice? Okay. Oh. Wait, 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 wait. Over here. Who's pointing? Oh. Right there. <laughs> Hi, I'm Diana Mayhew, the president of the National Cherry Blossom Festival, and here are guests of Barbara and David Ehrlich, and very excited to hear Diana today talk about her presentation of Eliza Sidmore. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I've worked every single day of my working life in D.C., but I was not born here. <laughs> and I'll just say our old introduction to the cherry blossoms was from our longtime member, Ann McClellan, who not only spoke, what, decades and a half ago on cherry blossoms and the origins. Did you know she was here? And then she's also put together panels for AOI on bonsai and things at the National Arboretum. So... Welcome back, Anne. Nice to see you. Anybody else? I think that I don't see. I do not. That's it. I think we're, well, thank you. Well, welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you could be here um, today because I think it's going to be a great presentation today. So it's a perfect, perfect time for you to come to, to be a first time visitor. And we also have a milestone um, that, that we'd like, we are happy to announce because we, we want to wish um, a, our longtime treasurer and one of the saviors of, of AOI over the years, uh, Hewlett Taylor. And it is her birthday today. So uh, I will. I want to say. I'm so glad you all did that. I was not going to do that into the microphone for you. So thank you for spontaneously doing that, save, saving yourselves from that. So happy birthday. Thank you for spending it with us, with it, with us today. There's two other birthdays. Oh, let's get two At birthdays. Our table, your longtime members, I don't say how long, but Capitondo <laughs> and uh, Flores. Whoa. <laughs> okay. Always. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow. What if, well, we will dedicate all of our cake to you today as we eat it. We will think fondly. We'll have wonderful birthdays, all of you. Thank you for being with us for it. And this, um, I'm going to jump ahead from where I was going to start, but we... This is a perfect lead-in for me to, to um, let you know that we are starting a new column in our newsletter, um, and that is going to be on our own history and family histories. So we're going to highlight, with your help, um, our members and their connections to D.C. and your family history, basically how and why uh, you, you can be and are a member of AOI. Um, so we're looking for submissions, one or two paragraphs that we would be able to, to share with the rest of the members uh, on how, um, how you are connected to, um, to us, to the city, and, and possibly to each other, because it looks like we have a lot of connections uh, amongst AOI members as well. If you're interested, um, please, you can either ask questions or um, send in submissions to uh, our email address, aoiofdc at gmail.com, uh, or me directly. You can let me know, um, and I will forward them to John Edwards, that, and we will start uh, getting them into our newsletter uh, in, in an attempt for all of us to get to know each other a little bit better, uh, because I think we do learn about each other every time we do something like this and, and get a chance to know, especially about uh, the fifth, seventh, eight, thirteenth generations um, that are that are connected to Washington. So look, I'll send out an email on that as well in case you want want some more information. Um, we'll we'll take pictures with that too in case you have any great great old pictures. Um, I don't see her. Kim's Kim. Am I missing Kim? I don't see Kim. To, no, today. Okay, so um, I am. I, I'd like to announce. I'm thrilled to announce um, that we have a new board member. Um, Kim Bender has has joined our board. She is a, a an AOI member as well as the executive director of the Heyrich House Museum. 
Um, she is, was appointed at our board meeting this, this past month, and she's going to be serving a two-year term. If you are, are not familiar with Kim, a quick background, um, she's been at Hyrick House for about a decade, and she's been working to make it a more inclusive um, public space, a more vibrant public space with more programs over that, that time. She has also collaborated with um, organizations that we're all probably familiar with, the DC History Conference, the DC Archives, um, as well as conducting her own research on DC history. Uh, and in 2017, she was honored by the Washington Business Journal as uh, one of the, the special 40 under 40. Um, so we are thrilled to be able to have her on our board and to connect uh, with her research and what she's working on and hopefully bring some of that vibrancy, uh, more of that vibrancy to, to our programming as, as well. You can learn more about her. We'll have a press release on our social media. We are now on LinkedIn. Uh, check us out there as well as on uh, Twitter and Facebook and, and our website, um, or certainly talk to, to Kim herself. So we're, we're really looking forward to that. So um, thank you to, to Kim for, for uh, joining our board and, um, and let us know if you have any questions about that, that as well. Things coming up. Uh, just to give you, we're, we're in high gear in D.C. at the moment. Uh, Earth Day is coming up this, this weekend, so there are a lot of events around. Uh, but there are also some fun things. Uh, the Petworth Porch Fest, which I don't know if you've heard about this, where people come out on their porch and they, they sing. Uh, and they, they have uh, musical groups that they form together, as well as people with a guitar, and just come out on their porches and start to sing um, on Saturday from, from 2 to 6, if you're in Petworth. Um, the 90th annual Georgetown House Tour is this Saturday, run by St. John's Church. Uh, and there are still some tickets available for that. They have a tea and, and a house tour where you go into a couple of the historic houses in, in D.C. and in the, in the gardens. Um, there's an Ella, Fitz, Ella Fitzgerald jazz vocal competition at Blues Alley, if you're looking for that. Um, the, uh, the D.C. Preservation League is having an event at the Potter's House, uh, which is one of the oldest kind of community centers as well as businesses um, that's in, in the city and talk about its history as well. Um, and in case none of that sounds appealing, there is the National Cannabis Festival at the RFK Stadium, and that can maybe get you through the weekend um, if, if you need something. I don't know what's going to be available there, but it might be at least get you to Monday. Um, with it. And Mary had a, su a suggestion, uh, Barbudo, that uh, we they are accepting uh, I, suggestions, I guess, um, for renaming Dave Thomas Circle. And if this might be a great group to come up with interesting names as they remake that intersection. Uh, and I think on NBC.com uh, uh, or uh, also I think it was Axios DC, um, you can go, what was that? NBC4Washington.com or Axios DC will give you a link to go ahead and make your own suggestions so that we can rename Dave Thomas's circle since it won't be a circle anymore as they're, as they're redeveloping that. Um, so with, with uh, that, any other, any other questions, calls from, the, calls from the floor before we move on to our, our speaker today? Well, we are very excited to have and, and very lucky to have um, Diana Parcell uh, with the, oh, oh, Nelson, I'm so sorry. That was it. I knew I was skipping over something. Nelson, trivia, you're up. I have a couple of quick announcements first. Everybody, of course, pays your uh, income tax, federal income tax, this week, I hope. Uh, there have been bills in Congress to exempt D.C. residents from federal income tax, like the territories. <laughs> there, there, the, the, the proposal is actually getting more and more uh, bipartisan support. But in, in uh, view of that, I have some uh, 
advance checks here. So please don't, please don't leave today without getting your refund. <laughs> also, last month we had Mrs. Sweeney, Sarah Sweeney, who saved the Bank of the Metropolis at 15th and F. Uh, she convinced the British not to burn down the building. She had a story about it was, a, it was a property owned by a poor widow, and it was her sole support of income, which was a total fabrication. The bank rewarded her $100 for saving the bank. And in today's money, that's $1,709. Somebody figured that out. That's a lot of money. That would even be admired by, by D.C. Uh, lawyers today figure out what that was for an hour. She did it in five minutes. She earned $1,709. I have some cards for that if you'd like to learn more about Mrs. Sweeney. Now for the trivia question. I have to put my glasses on so I can get that right. <clears throat> we had a very tr tricky transition of government, if you remember, at a presidential level recently. I won't go into the details of that. <clears throat> Two months prior to the upcoming elections, an incoming first-term president drafted the following memorandum. It seems exceedingly probable that this administration will not be reelected. Then it will be my duty to cooperate with the president-elect to assure a peaceful transition between the election and the inauguration. The president then signed this memo and had every member of his cabinet sign the memo as well. Who was the president? John Adams. No, that's a, could be. No. I guess Pardon? <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. Pardon? No, that's a good one, too. Truman? No. You got it. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> now, he kept this a secret, this memorandum. He drafted it himself. He didn't have his secretary sign it. And he had his whole cabinet countersign under his name. But he didn't reveal the contents of the memorandum. He folded it over, over his name, and had them all sign. It's known as the memorandum uh, that, that was unknown, that, 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 that was the uh, secret memorandum. They didn't know what they were signing. And uh, that says something about Lincoln, too, that he could get a president to sign a memorandum that they didn't know what they were signing. <laughs> okay, we've got a winner. Don't forget to get your checks. Stop by. Oh, yeah, I got it. Now we have our presentation, obviously, on Eliza Skidmore, as we have behind it. And I will remind you right up front that books are going to be available for sale at the back of the room um, after, uh, after we hear from Diana. A uh, quick introduction. Diana Parcell is a professional writer, editor, and former journalist who has worked at the National Geographic, NIH, Washington Post, as well as several environmental research centers in Southeast Asia. She's a graduate of the University of Missouri School of Journalism and Johns Hopkins University, received a Mayborn Fellowship in Biography and the Biographers International Organization 2017 Hazel Rowley Prize. Uh, though she was born and raised in Ohio, she has made Washington her home uh, for uh, enough years so that she is a future AOI member. Uh, and she was among one of the uh, groups of writers and editors who founded the online Washington Independent Review of Books in 2011. She's a regular volunteer at the National Book Festival every fall, and for the past decade has been a volunteer docent for public tours at the Library of Congress, uh, which I'm guessing also came in handy in doing the research for this book, because it sounded like that was, a, that was a, um, a place where she could really delve into this. And it's an, a fascinating subject, certainly 
being timely for this uh, time of year. Hopefully you had a chance to go enjoy the cherry blossoms uh, and now get a chance to learn more about Eliza Skidmore. Uh, we welcome and thank Diana Parcell. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Cindy. Is this, is this okay, the volume? Okay, thank you very much for having me. I love speaking about this topic. I have lived with this woman for 10 years, <laughs> uh, researching her story. I didn't know what I was getting into when I started out. I'd never done a book. Uh, I just want to give you a very quick introduction because people always want to know, how did you find this woman? It wasn't here in Washington, D.C. It was in Southeast Asia. And as Cindy mentioned, I was working there. I was a science writer for a while, and I bought a small book, Java, the Garden of the East, published 1897 and reprinted in paperback. Well, I read this book, and I was very impressed with it. I thought it held up quite well after a century. Uh, I learned a lot in it. It was very descriptive, and it was also very, the voice of the author I found very engaging. E.R. Sidmore, who was he? What took him out to Java 100 years ago? So I went online and I found a little Wikipedia entry, not very long, but what it told me stunned me. This was an American woman. She had written six books of travel. She had been the first woman elected to the board of National Geographic Society in 1892. Probably the first woman to have photographs in the magazine and then came the killer. This was the person who introduced the idea of bringing Japanese cherry trees to Washington. I had lived in Washington over 30 years, like most of you in this room. I went to see those trees every year, and I had never heard this woman's name. So, as Cindy mentioned, I did a lot of the research at the Library of Congress. Uh, you know, I, I, I was curious about the trees and all of that, and who she was, and where she came from, and where she got this idea. But I was really also interested in her story as a woman's story. How in the world did she do all these things in her era. So those were some of the questions I set out to answer, and I did find very, very little at first. Um, I did discover that her personal papers had been destroyed after her death by a relative. Uh, there was very little on her, but she appeared in two dozen biographical indexes. Well, that told me she was a very important person in her day. I found copies of her original books. I found kind of a handful of her journalistic articles, and that was it. So I took it from there. I started going to the Library of Congress regularly, researching her, putting together the clues, and I just uh, uh, followed them where they took me. But after a couple of years, I was into this project, and I had a huge breakthrough. I knew that Eliza Sidmore had come to the city and had become a journalist. I learned that she grew up here, and I'm going to tell you more about that in a minute. But I was researching in these, I was searching at the library and its records in these databases, historical newspaper databases, and then one day, I don't know how it happened, I discovered she had been writing under a pen name. <laughs> It was an unusual pen name, Ruhama, which was her middle name, her paternal grandmother's name. So I went back to those databases, and I started changing my search term to Ruhama. I ended up uncovering almost 800 newspaper and magazine articles this woman wrote in her 40-year career. So this was a huge breakthrough, because what did that do? That gave me date lines from those newspaper articles that allowed me to start a chronology of her life that told me where she was and what she had done. 
So that was really where the project began to take off, and I was able then to follow those leads and to fill in the pieces of her story. So that's kind of uh, where it happened. I ended up finding records uh, at a couple dozen institutions. In some cases, it was a single letter. In some cases, it was an entire collection of letters. For example, at the Library of, uh, I'm sorry, at the New York Public Library, I found a folder of her letters to her editor at the Century Magazine. I don't think these had ever been quoted. I'd never seen them before. What a gem of information, because they told me where she's traveling. You could see into the mind of this woman. You could see her following up on story ideas. And you could actually see her personality in these letters. So they became a very, very important source in the book. So let me back up and tell you about Eliza Sidmore. This, by the way, is my website. Uh, you can visit that website. There's a page on it that will tell you some of the presentations I've done. Uh, National Arboretum, uh, Politics and Prose, uh, some others. Today, today's show featured me a couple weeks ago. So uh, they're all on a page called News and Events if you want to get more background information. All right, so Eliza Sidmore. I changed my presentation around and dropped this slide in at the last minute because I remember reading somebody who told me, or I read it online, that this organization was started in 1865. So look at the date on these photographs, 1865. Eliza Sidmore came to Washington as a five-year-old child during the Civil War. Her um, she, spent, she was born in Iowa, but she spent her early years in Wisconsin. Her, uh, her mother's family were early settlers in Madison. Her brother, I'm sorry, her uncle became the founding editor of the Wisconsin State Journal. So she grew up already with a little bit of uh, um, uh, familiarity with journalism. And besides that, she had an older brother. She had uh, a half-brother and, a, and a, a regular brother here, George. But her older brother, Edward, who was 13 years older, became an apprentice to the uncle. And he eventually became an important stepping stone in Eliza's own career. So he, he joined, uh, he was in the Civil War, and he was stationed over at Arlington uh, for a number of years. Well, a big important event happened in 1862, right in the middle of the war. For some reason, the Sidmore's marriage fell apart. I couldn't find the reason for that. Uh, but her father left the family and went west. Mrs. Sidmore took her two young children and came to Washington, D.C. I speculate in the book why she did that. You know, there were jobs in D.C. She needed to support herself. Her son had been uh, stationed for a while over in Arlington. Uh, I think she was interested in volunteering for the war effort. But I also think that she, cut, she had a, <laughs> a second rather scandalous marriage. There were three marriages, and the middle one was rather scandalous after I discovered that she had been divorced in like 1849 or so. And uh, this would have, you know, she would have had a, a quite a bit of a scandal. And I suspect she probably got out of Dodge in part because she wanted a fresh start and she wanted the anonymity. I don't know, but I speculate it's a combination of these factors. So she came to Washington. And she raised these two young children on her own. She took in boarders for quite a number of years. She also got a job at the U.S. Treasury, which you probably know was one of the first agencies in D.C. to hire women, starting in the Civil War. <clears throat> Excuse me. She attended, as a young child, Georgetown Visitation, at least for two years. I was only able to find records for two years. A lot of their uh, school records burned in a fire. But I did find her school records for the first two years. And it's remarkable because... We already see in the first grade the aptitude of this woman for world travel and for her future career. At the end of that term, she won two prizes. 
One was for spelling and reading, the other for geography. She told an interviewer later in life, as a young child, she loved playing with maps and a globe. I was always planning journeys, she said. My dreams were always of other countries. So we begin now already to see uh, where her career is headed. So she went to Oberlin College for a short time. She didn't stay. She was there about 18 months. And then a, an important event happened, 1876. If you know your US history, you know that was the year that the United States celebrated the 100th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. So they had this huge centennial celebration in Philadelphia. It was essentially America's first World's Fair. It was a really big deal, 35 countries participating. This is the opening ceremony, the, day, uh, the dedication ceremony on opening day. Eliza Sidmore is in this crowd. <laughs> she had broken in, she made her debut as a journalist at the Philadelphia Centennial. So she went there, she uh, wrote for uh, five or so articles the first week for a newspaper here in Washington called the National Republican. I was able to find that that half-brother I mentioned earlier was a senior editor on that paper. Well, that tells us how this came about. So she, from the get-go, was a very fluent and uh, fast writer, clearly, because she turned out five articles in about five or six days. She went back in the fall, covered it again for another month. Then she came to Washington. And she became a society writer. Well, again, if you know your DC history, uh, and this surprised me a great deal to discover the large number of women who were working as newspaper correspondents in Washington after the Civil War. Newspapers were trying to expand their readership to get more women readers. But also, we had the Gilded Age. And as you know, that was a time of extravagance, extravagant entertaining with all these millionaire congressmen trying to outdo one another on the scale of their entertaining. Well, the newspaper editors felt that you needed women to cover this news. You needed somebody who could describe a ball gown or who could kind of uh, translate all these intricate protocols of the social system. So there were a couple dozen women here in Washington working as society correspondents for newspapers around the country. There were even some, there were probably, I think there were close to 20, who were accredited to the press gallery on Capitol Hill. I had a you know, big surprise. So anyway, Eliza Sidmore becomes one of these women who is writing a society column. She files three days a week for a newspaper in St. Louis. But she did something a little different from her colleagues because when summer, you know, the social season raged from roughly opening of Congress in 1st of December to Lent, then people would leave town. They would go off to their uh, country homes, to resorts. Uh, they'd go back to their home districts. So she started in those off months traveling. She crisscrossed the country several times writing travel letters for the newspaper in St. Louis. And by doing this, one of her colleagues in Washington, a male colleague, wrote that she was so prolific and so successful, she was making more money than some of the male reporters in Washington. So she was very enterprising and very hardworking uh, from the get-go. Well, a big milestone, uh, another big, oh, here she is, by the way, as a young reporter. I love this photograph. I just think it captures her so well. This happened to be, I discovered, taken in 1876 on a trip she made out west. You could see the hairdo. This is not a young woman who's concerned about, uh, you know, uh, uh, looking like a, a, an ingenue or something. She was very practical. This was taken in the Dakota Territory. Uh, when she went out for three months and ended up reporting uh, from a couple of, uh, uh, from Bismarck, Dakota, 
And she actually interviewed at the time uh, a member of the Nez Perce who were being forced off their land in the Pacific Northwest and being uh, uh, escorted by the US military to the Indian Territory in Oklahoma. She scores an interview with one of them in a, in a you know, teepee. I don't know what we call them today, but a teepee, and, uh, or a lodge house, I guess, and um, reported on this. So that gives you an idea of her enterprise because she really was a freelancer. She was writing per piece. So at any rate, that led to big, big develop in her life, uh, development in 1883, she decides to go to Alaska. John Muir had gone to Alaska in 1879 and 1880 because he was very interested in glaciers. So he went up there, he traveled around the area in a canoe with native Alaskans studying the glaciers. Eliza Sidmore read about his pieces, she uh, read about his travels, and she followed in his footsteps. So in 1883, she signed on to a trip to Alaska both as a sightseer and a reporter. So she's writing about Alaska still for the newspaper, filing these articles. And a very, very um, significant development occurred during that trip because normally the ships would go, these are mail steamers, they contracted to deliver the US mail. They would start off in San Francisco, go up to Puget Sound, and then make that thousand journey up the Inside Passage turn around and sail back down. Well, this was the only way to get to and from Alaska. But on the trip she made in the summer of 1883, the captain decided to take a detour. So he turned around and started south, but he cut west and went over to this bay called, later, Glacier Bay. And he takes that ship up into Glacier Bay way up into the north of Glacier Bay to see if they could get a glimpse of these glaciers that John Muir had described. So Eliza Sidmore wrote about this in her newspaper column. She repeated her journey the following summer, and then she turned those newspaper dispatches into what's now considered the first travel guide to Alaska. So this is among her legacy. She ended up later writing a second book on Alaska in 1893. It was much more comprehensive, but together the writing by her and John Muir really helped stimulate the beginning of Alaska tourism in the late 1890s. So here you see people in Glacier Bay and just how remarkable it was. Well, her writings on Alaska impressed the people at National Geographic. It had been founded in 1888. She became a member in 1890. And this man, Gardner Green Hubbard, who was the father-in-law of Alexander Graham Bell, was one of the chief patrons and founders of the National Geographic. He also had a very keen interest in Alaska exploration. So Eliza's work impressed him. He became something of a mentor to her at National Geographic. And later, he would organize delegations to attend scientific conferences. And he would include her, you know, the only woman in these groups that would represent the society at these conferences. And as a result of all this, in 1892, they elected her secretary. That made her the first board member of the society. She wrote some early articles on Alaska in the magazine, but she did most of her writing for the magazine after the turn of the century. Uh, after the turn of the century, they got a new editor. It was actually the uh, um, son-in-law of Alexander Graham Bell, a, a fellow named uh, Gilbert Grosvenor. He came in, and in 1905, he introduced changes that led to what we know today as the classic National Geographic formula of heavy on pictures. So she started working with him uh, around that time. She wrote uh, about 
uh, seven or eight articles for him, and she also would acquire photographs. She also took photographs, uh, and some of those appeared in the magazine, but she was also quite a photo. Um, she acquired photos, so we would think of her today as a photo editor, because he needed photographs to fill that magazine. Well, here we have the next big milestone in her life. 1885, the same year her Alaska book came out, she goes to Japan. Why Japan? Because her brother George was a US consular official there, and he went on to spend most of his 39-year career in Japan. Eliza and her mother went out that summer, and it changed both their lives in a dramatic way because Mrs. Sidmore decided to live in Japan with her son. And Eliza suddenly has a part-time home in Japan. So she's now able to come and go pretty regularly. So she became an established authority on Japan, which of course most Americans knew very little about at the time. She started writing about Japan for magazines like The Century, which was the most important magazine of its day, Harper's Bazaar, uh, other, other magazines as well. But besides living in Japan, this gave her a base for traveling around the region. And these are her books. She ended up writing seven books. Six books of travel, and then the last one on this list, As the Hague Ordain, is a uh, novel based on reporting she did during the Russo-Japanese War in 1904-1905. She went off and she interviewed some Russian prisoners at a POW camp in Japan. She was going to write about that as a magazine article, but she said it was too complicated, so she turned it into a work of fiction, thinking that that would be more accessible to people. You see this third one on the list, it says CPR Guide. That was the Canadian Pacific Railway. She wrote for them, she produced a travel guide for them. It helped subsidize some of her travel. And in fact, in I think it was 1894, 1895, she made a year long trip around the world under the auspices of the railway. That also enabled her to collect material for a couple of her books. She filed articles for several magazines, but it helps explain how she was able to finance some of her travels. And I've already alluded a little bit to her photography. She. Uh, had taken up photography around 1890, was the fairly first reference I found. She was taking photographs of John Muir at his cabin that he built in Glacier Bay, and that was 1890. So she is, uh, has taken up photography, and it says here, from the Smithsonian Image Collection, she has a, uh, a collection of several hundred of her photographs at National Geographic because the Smithsonian lent her photographic equipment to document her travels. Uh, there are some letters in the book where she's corresponding with the president of the, uh, 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 the uh, director of the uh, National Museum. She collected art, she collected a lot of Asian art in her life, she lent objects to the museum, she had a close uh, working relationship with them, and there's even one 11 page letter I found where she is writing to the director of the National Museum reporting on the collections at half a dozen museums in India. So this was the kind of person she was, she had connections everywhere. Now we're going to get, finally, into the story of the cherry blossoms. This is one of my favorite pictures in the, in the book. Unfortunately, it's not in color in the book. But this gives us an idea of where her vision came from for the idea of bringing Japanese cherry trees to Washington. She fell in love with cherry trees. She said they were the most beautiful thing in the world, and she couldn't understand why America 
did not have cherry blossom trees. Why didn't we have these in our cities and parks? And she said, what better place to do this than in the nation's capital? Well, this had been her adopted hometown. She had watched its growth over the years. So she starts pitching the idea of planting some Japanese cherry trees along the Potomac. If you know the history of Potomac Park, you know that it was basically kind of a swampy, marshy uh, area uh, uh, beyond the Washington Monument. The tide would, it was very low-lying ground, the tide would come in, it would flow almost to the base of the Washington Monument. People got fed up with it, it was smelly, it was nasty. So uh, around the early 1800s, I'm sorry, uh, 1880s, Congress allocated the money to fill that in. And they said, we will turn this into a park. So the Army Corps of Engineers, that's what they did. They spent the next 20 years filling in that land and turning it into Potomac Park. This <laughs> was a real discovery because I found out in reading Eliza Sidmore's columns from her days as a young reporter, that in 1883, now keep in mind, this is before she has ever gone to Japan, she describes in one of her newspaper columns going down to National Mall to see this work in progress on Potomac Park, on the creation of Potomac Park. She describes riding the elevator to the top of the Washington Monument, which we see here. This is what that elevator was like. It was a platform with a cage around it. It had these pulleys that swung out and dropped the stones into place. So she describes in her column this eight minute ride to the top of the Washington Monument through the darkness and hearing the tap, tap, tap of the chisels when they finally reach the top. So this is what that experience was like. I also love this photo because if you really look closely, the very, very back are several women holding parasols. I don't think that's Eliza Sidmore, but it just goes to show that people did this at the time. They rode this thing to the top of the monument. So she writes in her column, this is going to be one day the largest and most beautiful park in Washington, D.C., a place of magnificence in future administrations. So this, remember, 1883, she has not even gone to Japan yet, but we now know she had the seeds of this in the back of her mind so that when she eventually grew to love cherry blossoms and thought that we should bring some to D.C., she already had a spot in mind. Well, this was a major discovery because it really does show us the beginnings of the evolution of her vision and her idea. While this was all happening, a USDA botanist named David Fairchild was also, he was, he was a plant explorer. He would roam the world looking for new species and varieties of tree, um, trees and bushes and food crops to introduce to the United States to expand the diversity of US agriculture. He independently discovered cherry trees on one of his plant exploration trips. He also said, my gosh, these are unbelievably beautiful. He wanted to find out whether they would grow in the Washington area. So here we have a picture taken from his estate in Chevy Chase, his, his wife, Marion. He imported 100 or so trees, grew them to study their conditions, and they did splendidly. So he encouraged people in his neighbors in Chevy Chase to plant trees, but he also mounted a publicity campaign to bring cherry trees to DC. So he and Eliza Sidmore now are allies in this effort, but they still have this obstacle in the way. The guys in the Army Corps of Engineers who were in charge of the parks, they were very conventional in their ideas of what a park should be, what the landscaping should be, and they heard her out and they ignored her. 
and this happened several times. Then we have a big development when the Tafts come to the White House in 1909. Both of the Tafts were very interested in the development of Potomac Park. They saw it as a wonderful uh, uh, civic uh, arena kind of uh, a place where people, common people could go and enjoy leisure and recreation. So uh, as he was a war secretary under uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Taft was really in charge of the Army Corps of Engineers, and he followed this work in Potomac Park very closely. So when they came to the White House, Mrs. Taft decides she's going to build a bandstand down by the Potomac. She had been trained as a musician, so she calls in the military aide at the White House and says, I have this idea, and this is only a month after, after they've entered the White House. So she gets this bee in her bonnet that she's going to create this public space, this public gathering space where Washingtonians and visitors can gather along the river late in the day for band concerts. So the word gets out and Eliza Sidmore realizes this is a lot like the idea I have to have a gathering place along the river where people can enjoy cherry trees. So she writes a note to Mrs. Taft urging her to incorporate it or to approve the planting of cherry trees along the river. And this is a very famous note when Mrs. Taft wrote back two days later and said thank you for your idea of the trees I have taken the matter up. So now we have some real progress here. She was like a racehorse bolting out of the barn. That same day, Mrs. Taft called people in, uh, her, her assistant, her, uh, uh, it was a, a military guy who was an assistant in the White House, ordered him and his gardeners to find cherry trees wherever they could at U.S. nurseries. And they finally tracked down some trees. But in the meantime, Eliza Sidmore's behind the scenes. She kicks this project up a notch thanks to her Japanese contacts. We have a couple men, a couple Japanese men who are visiting Washington at the time. This guy, um, Jokichi Takamine was a very famous chemist, very wealthy, lived in New York City. He came to Washington for some social events in the company of the Japanese consul in New York. Eliza is so excited at this breakthrough with Mrs. Taft that she tells these guys about what's happening. Dr. Takamine said, oh, I would like to donate 2,000 trees to her project. So this really began as an individual gesture of, uh, 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 as a gift, a private gift. But the Japanese consul said, no, I think maybe it'd be better if we gave them on behalf of Japan and Tokyo to the people of Washington. So that is how it unfolded. That led to uh, th that plan. And I found some records that I report in the book that I don't think have been published elsewhere. One of them, May 12, 1909, Eliza Sidmore writing to the Japanese consul in New York and saying, Dear Mr. Mizuno, I have just come from the White House and a meeting with Mrs. Taft, and she would be delighted to accept this gift of the trees. So now we know that she didn't just come up with the idea. She was the actual intermediary between this gift of the trees from Japan. She stayed uh, in touch with Mrs. Taft. This is another letter that I haven't seen previously. It was in the batch of letters I found at the New York Public Library. She's writing to her editor in New York and she's saying, I just came from a meeting with Mrs. Taft. And here is her plan. Here's the plan they came up with for how to plant those trees around the tidal basin. Right up there, uh, she's written in Bandstand, Potomac River, and here's the layout of the trees. And they were, she was very thrilled because of the, the idea that they were going to uh, create these avenues of trees in doubles. 
so that they would reflect in the water, which was kind of traditional in Japan. And that, of course, is how it looked in the end. This is uh, 10 years later in 1922, after the first ones were planted. But you can see how much that adhered uh, to that uh, landscaping plan they came up with. But, as we may know, or you may know, there was a snag. Because in 1910, when, those first, when that first batch of 2,000 trees arrived, the USDA inspected them and said, these are full of pests. These are non-native insects. They could be a huge threat to US agriculture. We need to destroy them. And they did. They burned all 2,000 of those trees. It was practically on the, white, uh, the grounds of the Washington Monument because the USDA had storage facilities there. So all those trees went up in smoke. The Japanese were very gracious. They said, we will send you a replacement batch. They will be grown under pristine conditions. So that replacement batch, which was 3,000 at this time, arrived in the spring of 1912. And it was on March 27th, 1912, that they planted the first two cherry trees from that batch of 3,000 down all, uh, along the tidal basin, to, right in the, uh, the north edge of the tidal basin. Mrs. T uh, Mrs. Taft put together a very small uh, dedication ceremony. She invited three people as her guests. Two were the Japanese ambassador and his wife and Eliza Sidmore. So she was there that day to witness the first planting of those cherry trees. And it's not been written about much because the press barely covered it. Uh, it's, uh, we've known very, very little about that event other than a few brief paragraphs that were in the newspaper. But that's what happened. Uh, so now we have the beginnings of those cherry trees. About 1,800 of them at the time out of the batch of 3,000 were planted around the tidal basin. So Eliza Sidmore then uh, is, is settling back in D.C. by this time. I, I, uh, she was uh, uh, a longtime resident on and off of D.C. She had several homes here. I was able to track down some of the places where she lived. I discovered that in 1919, this is the year before women got the vote, she was awarded an honorary PhD by George Washington University in gratitude or in recognition of her uh, uh, writing ability that, uh, or her writing uh, that, uh, that uh, advanced cross-cultural understanding. The uh, Emperor of Japan also gave her a major prize around this time. He gave her the highest civilian medal for her favorable writings on his country. She went on to uh, settle in Europe after the war. She actually did some reporting from World War I on uh, the Re uh, Red Cross relief efforts. Then she moved to Europe in her final year. She was a fan of the League of Nations. She had a Japanese friend uh, and, uh, with his American wife. He became one of the top officials at the, at the League. And so she moved to Geneva. And she spent her final years there. She died in 1928 at the age of 72 after an emergency appendectomy. So her ashes then were taken to Japan and deposited at the grave site in Yokohama, where her mother and her brother were buried. So the Japanese know Eliza Sidmore. They've known about her for years. They revere her as an early friend of Japan. They go to her gravesite every year during cherry tree season, and they hold a little memorial service at her grave, which I was able to witness the year that I went over to do some research on her. So here we have at the, uh, her gravesite in Japan. And of course, 
It's only been the last 10 years or so that we've even learned about her here, and that came about mainly because when we celebrated the centennial of the cherry trees in DC, she began, uh, her name began to surface for the first time, and we now do have plaques down along the mall that recognize her. So I'm going to end there. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay. Uh, my qu simple question. Uh, Rolamine Quander. Um, I go down on, on the mall all the time as a licensed certified tour guide, and I see the cherry trees in all stages of their development. But one thing I don't see are cherries. <laughs> Would you explain why? Are they all male cherry trees or what? We don't have cherries coming Yes, out exactly. In fact, there's a funny story that she told late in life when she was recounting the history. Uh, she wrote a couple of very lengthy uh, newspaper articles in the 20s that explained the history of how all this happened. And that has become a very important source, one of the most uh, complete sources we have on the history of the trees. And in that, she's kind of mocked these uh, Corps of Engineer fellas that she's approaching and she kind of has a bit of fun with one of them because she says I approached him with my idea and he says cherry trees well uh, we can't have cherry trees because the kids the boys will uh, you know when the cherries are ripe they'll climb up into them and do damage and she says oh no no these cherry trees don't have cherries. And she's, as she's quoting him, she's saying, he, he responds, humph, humph, well, what good are cherry trees that don't have cherries? <laughs> so the concept of a cherry tree that was purely for ornamentation uh, was a new, kind of a new concept. So yes, it was something Americans had to learn about. And Eliza Sidmore wrote a very um, detailed article in uh, 1910 uh, in the Century Magazine when it looked like they were going to finally get cherry trees, Japanese cherry trees. She wrote a long uh, article that described the culture and the history of these cherry trees, explaining how they, they were purely decorative, that they were not uh, fruit trees. Hi, Judson French, soon to be member. Um, my family uh, grew up in a neighborhood called Kenwood in Chevy Chase. <laughs> yeah, people ask this a lot. Are those the original cherry and, trees? Well, <laughs> so same type of cherry trees, but they were, I guess, planted probably in around 32 or something in that neighborhood because my father moved there when he was 10. Um, but I was wondering if you knew the genesis of why Kenwood's trees were planted as the alternate location for everyone to flock to go watch the tree. <laughs> I don't know the history of the Kenwood trees. This question comes up. Do you, Diana? And if that's the fair, yeah, that. I was going to say, it dates back to the Fairchilds because, yes, Anne can answer this question. Hi. Hi. Uh, thank you. I'm Anne McClellan. And thank you, Diana. I always learn something new. That was really great. About the trees at Kenwood, they are from the same source that the trees that are around the tidal basin, but they were shipped, as you said, in the 20s or 30s, and they were um, brought by the Chevy Chase Land Development Company through the connections of David Fairchild, yeah. and I can talk more about that later, but yeah. it, that, that's why there's the myth that it's the same tree. Yes. It, it, David it's, it's Fairchild. It's the same variety, but not... His estate that I showed you the picture of was out there in Chevy Chase. So these were his, you know, this was his community, and he encouraged his neighbors. So they did plant about 300 trees back in 1908 on the city streets. But those later, I believe, were lost to development. But the Kenwood trees would have been a successor to that, and that's where this idea comes from out there. Hi. Okay. Hi, thank you. 
Uh, Bill Rice, thank you very much for your talk. How did the trees survive December 7th, 1941? World there War were II. several of those trees that were cut down in the middle of the night. Uh, 41, you're saying? You're talking about World War II. Yes, during World War II, some of those trees were uh, cut down. Right. How did they survive the very strong anti-Japanese feeling during the whole war. And I guess has an answer. I haven't heard this, so I'll learn something. Uh, that's a question I get a lot, too. And um, how, where I found the answer for this is at the DC History Center. They have journals that were kept, uh, a monthly records of what was happening in Washington. And what happened after the, the trees were chopped down, a few nights after Pearl Harbor, there were, I uh, forget how many, four, five or six of the choicest trees were chopped down. People were so upset that they formed citizen bands to patrol the tidal basin for the duration of the war to prevent any other action against the trees. They called them the Oriental Cherry Trees for the duration of the war, but they, they did everything they could, and it was the people who protected them. Which I mean, That's why I was waving my hands, because it's such a wonderful Washington story, because I think people forget that we're all here. We're people. We live here. We love it. We do things to take care of it. And this is a really great example. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you Anne. Carl Cole. <laughs> um, from the original batch of trees, there are a number that still exist. Can anyone tell me where they're currently located? I can tell you that one of them is on the grounds of the Library of Congress, and it's got a crutch. <laughs> yes. And the other batch is the located other, there. There are some that are in the original planting spot. There are some twisted trees in there that are probably uh, some of the original. There is also a story that um, not all of those trees were destroyed because the scientists said, let's keep a handful of these trees in reserve so that we can study them and see what kind of bugs these are, you know, for, for, uh, for our future um, edification. And uh, the story is that some of them were planted out at Haynes Point and that they are probably still out there today. I'm sorry to say I haven't been out there. They're still there. Okay, there <laughs> we go. If you want to see them, you would have to buy a round of golf. Yeah. Because they're on the white course between the third and fourth hole. <laughs> okay, but they, they're still there, and they're still going quite strong. Thank okay. you. Good to know. I'd heard they were. Good to get that verification. In terms of her professional life, it sounds like she had a relatively easy journey as a, as a professional woman in this time frame. Was there, did she connect with um, either other women who were also journalists and, and form kind of a, a community of that? Or was she pretty much a trailblazer, not just in, um, in, in where she went, but in kind of creating her own her she was career. a trailblazer, but I think one of the uh, keys to her success was that she was an incredible networker. She knew people everywhere. She developed connections everywhere. As you can see, just a few of these famous people that I've mentioned already. I mean, John Muir. She didn't just photograph John Muir at his cabin in Glacier Bay. She ends up finagling somehow to go and stay in his cabin with friends for a month. <laughs> she visited John Muir and his wife at their home in California. There are some letters I found where she's, she is uh, communicating with John Muir. You know, he became uh, very influential, of course, as the, as the chief figurehead of the new 
emerging U.S. conservation movement. That was happening at this time. Eliza Sidmore becomes a real activist in that. She is actually credited with introducing the idea or the campaign to make Mount Rainier a national park. She wrote one of the early uh, articles that talked about these forest reserves that the Harrison administration had just started, and a lot of those eventually became national parks as well. So she was out there writing about wilderness conservation at the same time John Mueller was. So uh, the Tafts, uh, Mrs. Taft, I found a letter showing Mrs. Taft having dinner <laughs> with Mrs. Sidmore in Yokohama. And uh, uh, Alexander Graham Bell had lunch with Mrs. Uh, Sidmore in Yokohama. So, so you know, these people are moving in the same circles. Uh, and so Eliza had uh, well-placed friends everywhere. She was a spinster, as she called herself and that she was part of this kind of merry band of spinsters. So there are no indications she regretted not marrying. <laughs> Well, what was happening, the first time Mrs. Taft went to Japan was the summer of 1900. The Tafts were on their way to the Philippines because he was going to head this commission to create a civil government. While they were in Yokohama for a week, they were getting ready to move on. That's when Mrs. Taft had, had dinner with Mrs. Sidmore. This summer, the ship is heading back on to the Philippines and their son catches, I think it's diphtheria, and they had to quarantine him. So Mrs. Taft has to stay behind with her son. So she and her, her sister who were traveling with them and the three children stayed in Yokohama for the summer. So this begins her love affair with Japan. And then later Taft as the war secretary under Roosevelt made a couple of trips to, to Japan. Uh, and so these are some of the associations. Thank you all. Thank you. I have to stay, stay here for one second. We'd like to, on behalf, on behalf of AOI, we would love to give you a certificate of appreciation. Thank uh, and thank you so much you. for being here. So wonderful, wonderful story. Thank you. And I'm going to assume that you will um, be happy to sign books in the back? I will. Yes. So please uh, stop by. I'm sure if you have any last minute questions, um, but also to buy the book. It is by the, um, the fireplace and the mantle that's in the back. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you all for coming. Um, next month, our, our, our speaker for next month's lunch is going to be journalist Ray Suarez. And if you uh, take a look at our, our website and our newsletter, we will have more information on that and look for emails as well. Um, have a wonderful weekend. Thank you for coming and uh, stay safe out there.